Hello, cinefans. I'm Kendall Coover, and this is Watching Classic Movies. My guest, John DeLeo, has written seven books about film. His latest is There Are No Small Parts, 100 Outstanding Film Performances with Screen Time of 10 Minutes or Less. We talked about the special characteristics of a brief but potent screen performance and the many stars who made a lasting impression in such a role. Welcome, John. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Kendall. I'm very happy to be with you. Your book got me thinking about different aspects of short but impactful roles. Some different aspects I hadn't considered before, and one of them was in that very first entry where you were talking about Elsa Lanchester in um, The Bride of Frankenstein, how she had been rather adventurous with that role, with the hisses and you know moving in the bird-like manners. I hadn't thought about the fact that this was an opportunity to be adventurous because you're not sustaining a whole film with the role. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure, you know, uh, if you're only in it for a few minutes, it's not make or break in terms of the entire film. You just do what you do and move on. Um, what fascinates me about that particular role is, of course, it's iconic, both as an image, the movie, the character, but they didn't necessarily know that when they were filming it. Yes, the first film was a hit, so they had a kind of a built-in audience, but you had to wonder if they were thinking, are we going too far? Are, are we bordering on the ridiculous? But they for it in a big way, and as I said, she, she never speaks in those four minutes, but she makes, uh, she gasps, she screams, she yells, and she hisses. She's both a full-grown woman and a newborn infant. She's both uh, an innocent and a monster, and she has sort of <laughs> a, sort of a full life in four minutes, a lot, mostly lows, a couple of highs. She has a forms an attachment to Dr. Frankenstein and <laughs> then is horrified by the monster, but she packs so much into it. And between the look, of course, with the lightning bolt in her hair, it's, it's certainly outrageous, but there is a humanity trying, struggling to get out, or as I said, her eyes dart around like a newborn or a puppy. And so it, it, she packs so much invention in these few minutes, and it's kind of both, it, it, it's electrifying, really, literally. <laughs> yes, in every way, in every way. And, it, and it, you do forget how short the performance is, and it is kind of emblematic of what a great, you know, short performance is. It can sometimes just take over the whole film. So that brings me to another question. Do you think that someone is capable of doing their best work in a role like that. I mean, have you seen an example of that? Well, I'll think of a, a pretty obscure actor who, um, in a movie most classic film buffs certainly know, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, and the actor that I write about is John Ray. Now, even, um, you know, diehard classic movie buffs would be hard-pressed if you mentioned the name John Ray to come up with something, but this is certainly the role of his movie career. Um, he's got a decent bull and all, all quiet on the Western Front, but this is really the one that shows, wow, this guy was something. And it's a fascinating part because he doesn't even have a name, he's just the farmer. But up till that point in the movie, about halfway, we're watching this fish out of water comedy with, you know, the hick and the city slickers. And then suddenly the depression bursts through the door in the form of this man demanding that the character take this movie seriously, take this plot seriously, and his desperation alters the Mr. Deez's outlook and it changes the plot of the movie. So it's kind of built in that the, the his four and a half minutes are going to be impactful, but the desperation, the depth of feeling that John Ray brings to this is so moving. When I was working on the book and looking at the scene over and over, I literally cried every single time I watched it. And I thought, how does someone do that? And I, I think he's someone, uh, we didn't get to see much else from him, whether he w w should have played bigger parts. You know, he was certainly the kind of character actor that looked like everybody in the street. There was nothing distinctive about him, nothing that said I should be a star. And so for someone like him, I think it was the performance of a lifetime because he was cast as he should have been and he showed what he could do. Yeah, and it, it, that brings me to another name, um, Florence Bates 
and Rebecca. Yes. That's another one where where she was so good. And, you know, that doesn't have the power of the role you just discussed. You know, it, it kind of bookends the action and it transitions the second Mr. Winter. But I realized that I disliked her so much that I kind of wrote her off and ignored her and didn't appreciate that she's so good because I disliked her that much. And just how brilliant she is at that new money kind of tackiness, you know? Yes. Well, she serves, she's one of the roles in the book. There are a number of them. They basically serve as a prologue to the main plot. So once the real plot gets going, like Robert Morley in The African Queen, there's part of the kickoff before we get to the real plot. And in Rebecca, Florence Bates's case, you know, once you're well into the movie, you forgot it started in Monte Carlo. However, she is so amusing, so funny in her tackiness, her vulgarity, that you have a fondness for her. And that kind of was her specialty. She did play a lot of people we're not supposed to like, but we enjoyed not liking her. <laughs> so that's a good thing. So she's doing her job in essence, but it's, it's, it's Very interesting. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So is there anyone else like that, that you think, oh, I really wish more people knew about them, even though they were doing these small roles well, more appreciated? I guess another, yeah, there's another of the character actors like a John Ray, um, Frank Puglia, who's in everything, okay. <laughs> in Casablanca, who's in everything. And uh, I write about him for the movie Black Hand, which is not even a well-known movie. So there's just someone to put a name to a face and give them three pages to put a spotlight on what they did. In terms of names, we know a little better than Mike Puglia. I'm always sort of champion, championing uh, Jan Sterling, who's in the book for Mystery Street. She's in the, again, like a, a prologue character. Her murder is what the plot is all about, so we have to get rid of her in the first 10 minutes. Um, but she always sort of gets um, short shrift when people are talking about the film War Ladies, whether it's Gloria Graham or Lauren Bacall, and you know, all people I like. But to me, Jan Sterling might have been the best of them all, and um, you know, she did play an occasional large role, like an Ace in the Hole and yeah. such, but... But she never really got her due, and she can be funny, she can be hard and scary, and I love writing about her because, again, when some people have a real passion for their work, you do feel like, you know, it's also a good deed <laughs> in a way. Yeah, with, with her, it, it feels real. She feels really dangerous. I think the male equivalent of that is maybe Lawrence Tierney, where you really feel like they could get up to something nasty, and I do think that, yes... If she hadn't had that role in Ace in the Hole, she probably would have just disappeared. And that's a real shame because she was in a prison flick too, wasn't she? I just remember her really sending out some ensemble cast. She's in two of them. She's in Cage. That's what I'm and thinking. she's in Women's Prison. Okay. So she's sort of the woman you're most likely to run into if you go to prison because she's there. Yeah, yeah. And that's the one that you need to get on your side right away. Well, on the other side of that, there's, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so on the other side of things, there's these character actors that, like, well, and I'm in the film festival audience. Well, TCM, classic film festival audience. People clap because they recognize him. And then the one that's at the top of the list, which you did include, is Mary Wicks. It's remarkable to me how beloved this actress is just for doing all these small roles. It's not quite... The level of love for, say, Thelma Ritter or, you know, that kind of a thing. But but everybody knows this woman. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I write about her book for now Voyager for her three minutes as the nurse. And it's 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 a tiny role. She has a few scenes. Not one of her scenes is a minute long. But she provides such warmth and humor at a time when the main character really needs it. She come back to the house. She's going to go up against her mother. Now she's sort of ready to stand up to her, but she needs an ally. And that's Mary Wicks in those few scenes. She makes us laugh. We know she's there for her. She's also tough with Gladys Cooper, which makes us like her even more. And so she provides such a lovely function at a moment we're so worried about this character that we love so much, Charlotte. And you're right, though, but she played, she usually played that role in, in 
variations in just about everything. And so the audience gets to love them. And unlike a Florence Bates, she's not going to be someone who's going to, you're going to love to hate. You're going to love to love because she's going to make you feel safe and secure and make you laugh, make you feel safe and all that stuff. So yes, we form attachments to those people that we feel are our best friends. It's true too, because I, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way, but you do kind of relax a little bit when she shows up. You don't realize the tension you've been feeling until she kind of cuts in there and, and brightens it a little bit. And I think that is an interesting thing about these roles is how they can change the tone, how they have power and that ability to change the tone of a film. And then we've also talked about how, you know, it can be a way to experiment. I mean, are there other qualities of these kinds of roles that you noticed when you were putting this book together? Well, I think, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, of course, if you have a large role, you have so many transitions within it. In a role that's less than 10 minutes long, it's trickier. So sometimes the ones that stand out are when somebody gets to show something else than you expect within those few minutes. Like, the, of course, a classic example is Ona Munson as Belle Watling. We meet her as the madam. You know, we, we expect her to be a certain way. And she has that beautiful, vulnerable scene in the carriage bonding with Melanie. And we see her in a whole different way as a mom, as someone who could have been a friend of Melanie's in a different social world. And so those contrasts, or um, on a lighter note, um, back to Boris Harloff, in the movie Lord, he comes on as kind of a comic character, a real, an over-the-top, crazy fashion designer who's lost his mind. But then switches and he turned to someone really scary and threatening. So I've been, I enjoyed writing about those people who were able to go somewhere within their, their few minutes. So it's not just one thing, because sometimes you can say someone was really good in something, but there's not much to say about it except, oh, they were nice. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, the, I enjoyed them. So well, what is there to necessarily say? So when, when a role offers that kind of um, so contrast within a role, I think that's nice. Yes. I was really impressed with the variety you had in this book because you had a good mix of roles that I would expect and some surprises that I wouldn't have included but made sense. And then just films I hadn't heard of. What, what was your process of putting this book together? What made you choose what you chose? Well... I made, I think I just made a big list first from memory and thought, uh, let me just with pencil and paper, just write down as many as I could think of, because I knew they had to be things that were somewhere in my memory to be good enough to be in the book, meaning that they were memorable uh, moments. And I think eventually, before I even started writing, I had a list of over 300, but I knew once I started looking that um, quite a few of them would be more than 10 minutes long, that I thought they were less, but were actually more like 15. And then, um, then I got, I guess, a little more calculating where I knew I wanted to start with a famous one, which is why it starts with Bride of Frankenstein. I could have started earlier, but I didn't want to start with an unknown actor in an unknown movie. I wanted to start with, boom, you all know this one, right? And I knew I wanted to go to the present day. So the last one's Al Pacino and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And then within that, I knew I wanted them to be spread as easily as I could throughout the decades and not have uh, chronological gaps. And then, of course, um, comedies and dramas, men and women, and, you know, try to balance as much as I could and make it really be sort of a, you know, some sort of history of Hollywood while you're reading along, you know, as it's going yeah. along. So you think you probably have enough for a part two then? Uh, so what's fun about it too is that anybody who loves film for those those many decades could come up with their own 100 if they sat down and tried to do it or spent a year and a half doing it. So it's, of course, very subjective. Like you said, it's a mix of what you expect would have to be in it, like Beatrice Strait in Network or Robert Duvall in To Kill a Mockingbird. They have to be in it. And then ones that, yeah, were close to my heart and people I love to talk about that are more obscure, like Gladys George in The Hard Way. 
which people who've seen it love it, but that would be one to make people go, oh, I don't know that one. I'll catch that next time TCM shows it. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that so many of the um, performances were from films of the studio age. I do think that that was a golden age for character actors, really. Yeah, well, there's that wonderful thing. Like, we, well, we kind of hit on it with Mary Wicks of that when you sort of created a type, you were used for that type very often. And I don't think people resented it so much. They weren't, oh, darn, I'm typecast. I think a lot of the character actors were thrilled. They found a sort of niche were so usable and that they could make eight, ten movies a year. And the audience, like I said, you'd come on, do your thing, and get out. And that had to be a really wonderful lifestyle uh, as it went on for years and years and years. So uh, I think, yes, it was a golden age of, of the character actor. And if you were, if you had a long-term contract, yeah, you were you really worked. And I hadn't thought about it, that that was probably why you saw these actors circulated so much. It was just the structure of the studios and, and how, how they worked with actors as opposed to the way it is today, a little more of a one-off type of thing. I, I, I can see that, though, how maybe a lot of these actors, especially the ones that are maybe a little older, I, I'm guessing a lot of them had stage careers and, and could have maybe been traveling for years as actors and maybe find it nice to settle in Hollywood and just go to the studio, come home, sit by the pool. Yeah, seems like a pretty sweet deal to me. Absolutely. You know, that's that's one of the things I did learn writing this book, because I obviously looked up backgrounds of all the people in the book, and some of the older ones, uh, people that we only know as old people, because that's what they were, 30s and 40s, and you think, oh wait, they were young ones, and just about all of them had lives in the theater, and um, interesting lives in the theater, and so they were bringing all that, and you're right, it must have been it's so much easier to just go to the factory, do yeah. your thing, and go home rather than touring, or playing eight shows a week and then touring from really extraordinary lives. Hollywood was just sort of the last part. And I love that because it doesn't, they don't have to deal with being this gorgeous star and transition. They're already settled into maturity. They're already ripened, I guess you could say. And so they they can just go and kind of slide down that last slope and retire. It's, it's a beautiful thing that I really had never considered before. But one of my favorite things to do is when I when an actor like that does stand out, I look him up on Wikipedia or, you know, some sort of a database and like, oh, they were gorgeous, <laughs> you know, <laughs> see how cute they were when they were young, you know. I mean, I'm always really fond of all the different phases, right? I do like a, a well-seasoned, beautiful elderly person, but it's fun to see them young like that, too. Like, oh, yeah, they were cute. They were hot. Sure. Yeah. Also, the, the fan magazines didn't care who they were dating or sleeping with, and they were free of all that stuff, too. You know, just do your job, go home, do anything you want. Nobody's interested. <laughs> that is a very good point. It just sounds better and better to me. Who wants to be a movie star? Pshaw. <laughs> I loved how you also included uh, musical um, performances because Sid Charisse in Singing the Rain, for one, like th- that's the kind of performance where it's kind of its own movie in a way. Well, you know, I, when I, I knew I would use Singing in the Rain in the book, even though I wasn't sure initially how, but I thought, I know there's somebody in Singing in the Rain, all those wonderful parts. And I think when I had time to watch it for the hundredth time, but for this book, with this book in mind, before it started, I thought, I bet it's going to be Douglas Fowley as the exasperated movie director in that great scene with the microphone sewn into the dress, because he's hilarious. But as it, and he still is, but as it went on, and when Sid Charisse came on, I thought, when you get to her, there's nothing like her in this movie till you get there, and there's nothing like her after it. Her impact is so singular and astounding, and I thought, why not do a dance performance? She doesn't speak, she doesn't sing. It's the only one in the book, the entire dance. And it merits it because, you know, Sid Charisse was not the world's greatest actress, but when she's dancing, she kind of is a great actress, and that's that's what she does. So it was, of course she goes in the book. Yeah, but that director performance is one of the all-timers. I mean, he's literally tearing his hair out. (laughs) (laughs) Douglas Fowley, I love you. 
<laughs> yeah, that makes me almost kind of want to look him up a little more to see what, what else he was about, because I never thought to do that just because there's so much in that movie, right? You're just kind of overwhelmed in that movie. Yeah. It's one of those ones where you just forget how good it is every single time and you're kind of stunned. But you also included Lena Horne, which, you know, her movie career was built on scenes that could have been taken out. And that's so bittersweet because the footage exists, but but you know that fact if, you know, if you dig into classic films at all. Yeah. But she also, I thought, well, I, I think she's a better actress than Sid Charisse. You know, she doesn't seem like she's learning the lines phonetically you know <laughs> but but it's another case where she really can act out the song and and she was probably one of the more alluring vocalists in that regard well i i thought it was the perfect choice then for her to write about her until the clouds roll by because in her few minutes she's getting to act the role through singing that we all thought she would play, including Lena Horne, when they made Showboat in 1951. And so it's kind of a bittersweet entry in the book that here is sort of a what if performance. He, she, it's almost like her audition reel. Like here, I'm showing you why I should do it. Look at what I could do. And you have five minutes of it and only only the song uh, can not help win that man. Um, so it was very nice for me to sort of, it's an interesting chapter for me because it's not just how good she is, but there's so much else going on within her and that character and the studio and what to come. It is one of the, to me, one of the biggest losses of classic cinema yeah. because she really would have nailed that role. And, and just, it is a little heartbreaking that she's showing it you this, even though there's also the sense of gratitude that the that it's there in this beautiful film that is very likely to be restored and preserved. I the thing about that too is that I think even Ava Gardner thought that Lena Horne should do it. Weren't they friends or something? I don't know yeah. if I'm remembering that right. Yeah, apparently Yeah, Lena Horne always said ironically that my, sort of my best girlfriend at MGM was the one who got it. And um uh, whether or not she said, I, uh, Ava said, I shouldn't do it, you should. He goes, well, you should do it. They're not going to give it to me, so you might as well do it. It's not, no matter what, I'm not getting it. And so, um, and, you know, she she did, a, uh, she did a good acting job with it. Um, but, again, it's still just one of those, this was the thing that was supposed to happen that did not happen because the timing was right. Sometimes it's like decades off and you think, well, this couldn't happen because the person wasn't there. But this was a case of everything was laid out. It was all in place. And that's what kind of stinks. Was that ever a real possibility to, because that's the part I can't ever remember, if they were ever going to go for I, it. I, I don't think it was ever a real possibility. It was certainly talked about, but yeah, you know, there was talk of Judy Garland playing it, and it, basically she was on her way out the door at that point. And I, I but I, I don't think Lena Horne was seriously considered because of, um, well, you know, <laughs> obvious of the race issue. But it's just, uh, it, yeah, it's just one of those. Um, it, it could have been, it should have been, and it just didn't happen. But as you said, we have to till the clouds roll by, we have a few moments, you know, and, and the other thing that stings from that is in till the clouds roll by, there's Catherine Grayson doing essentially the same thing, auditioning, and she gets the part five years later. So it, it was sort of a built-in audition reel. And so, you know, I guess they thought it was okay for a few minutes, but not if we're going to deal with the actual plot of Showboat, then it's a little... They thought it got a little tricky. So looking at this book, like, what, did you have any discoveries as far as these roles? I mean, were you looking for things or was it all kind of already in your mind what you wanted? You know, it's funny. I, I, once I got on the sort of um, conveyor belt of writing it, you're yeah. in such a fever of just what am I doing next, checking out the next one. Either it was too long, too short, what do I need next? And and it, it's kind of a big blur in a way. <laughs> um, I think it was 13, 14 months with, that, with time off because I just couldn't stop. Um, it, so it was 13 months in a good way. And I think I could do about two in a week. 
I guess, I mean, I think there were people I knew would be in it. Sometimes the surprise would be which performance. And I wish I could come up with a good example off the top of my head, but um, there were people, maybe like Agnes Morehead, I figured Agnes Morehead's going to be in this book. So, um, and I, I love the swan and she's got a great, sort of the opposite. We were talking about people who are the prologue of their movies. She's the climax. She comes in at the last minute to make sure everything is set right, even though she has no idea what's going on. But <laughs> that, that kind of um, wonderful thing, I, you know, it, I guess I guess what I learned too was so often it's the person, as I said with Sid Charisse, who's a little different from everyone else. Another good example is um, Mayor Astor and Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. There's so much theory chewing in the movie of good and bad varieties. And then you get to her two scenes and you're like, oh my God, this is a real person with a real story. And it's, a, again, electric and it's so quiet. Yeah. And you think, man, she just changed everything. <laughs> and she's barely, you know, she's just one scene she's standing, one scene she's sitting, but... Mm -hmm. The whole thing comes to a halt in a good way where you suddenly can't take your eyes off this person who's in a in a better movie, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 like just an ice cube on something hot, just kind of settling over everything. <laughs> it so completely changes the tone. So is there anything in this book that that you're like, oh, this is the one I hope people this is the one that I just really love that I don't think people know about, like this one actor. I think you, you talked about it a little bit with Mr. Deeds, but is there anybody else like that where yeah. you're like, oh gosh, I hope people discover this person. They so deserve the love. Well, I guess, I think I already mentioned the other one too about Glad my love of Gladys George um, yeah. so much, uh, her great roles, and particularly her few minutes in the hard way. I think um, I, I was most fascinated though by the performances that are, two and a half or two minutes that made it into the book. Hattie McDaniel in In This Our Life, Emery Parnell, another name. Uh, I had to, I think, look up the name when I knew I was going to put him in the book. He's the other half of the Myrna Loy scene in Mr. Bl Mr. Blanding's Bill's His Dream House when he gives the instructions. And basically in two minutes, all he really says is okay and yeah and aha. Uh -huh. But he is half of one of the funniest scenes of the decade. And I get, so I, I love uh, shining a particular spot on those two minute performances. The wonderful act James Edwards in The Killing, who again, his plot of racism is a completely different movie than the noir racetrack robbery we're watching. And again, he's in it for two and a half minutes and it, it just stabs you in the chest. Uh, it's so it's so touching and troubling. So I think some of those shorter ones are the ones that I, I got particularly excited about because I couldn't believe how short they were. Yeah. I have to say that the, the passages that interested me the most were it was like four minutes and under because if I knew it, I couldn't believe it that the impact did not correlate with the length. So yeah, that's a really interesting aspect of it. Well, it's been so fascinating to talk to you about this. I really, the book had me thinking differently about character roles, about the role that they play. I had never really thought about that. So I really appreciated your insight on that. I think it'll help me to appreciate these roles a lot more. So thank you so much for taking the time today, John. Oh, thank you so much, Kendall. I enjoyed it very much. For more information, including how to find John's book, go to watchingclassicmovies.com. I want to thank my listeners for your kind words and for spreading the word about the show. It means a lot. I invite you all to follow, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you for listening. This is Kendall Kruver, watching classic movies. Until next time. <laughs>